schools, very different objectives in a very different country. And uh, this was um, initiated by a group of multidisciplinary professionals who also invited Ram Kulkos, an architect whom you probably know, for whom I worked at that time and became part of this um, team of uh, designers of the program. And now I'm a programming director there. So a lot of what we do and a lot of inspiration comes from these two environments. And uh, by the way, our environments in which we work are very different. I like to show this slide that basically illustrates quite well two different cultural paradigms in which we work and live. So on the right is a, one of the most famous uh, Russian artists at the beginning of the 20th century, Boris Kostoryev. And uh, on the left, you probably recognize the design by Gerrit Rietveld, the zigzag chair. I think they both present quite well uh, the cultural differences with which we have to live and work. Um, on the one hand, a very structured, very structured, very rigid, uh, but in a way extremely beautiful uh, world of, of the Netherlands, very artificial. On the other hand, more kind of Byzantium-based, uh, more soft, but also in a way dangerous uh, Russian context. Um, and um, that keeps us in good shape because you cannot copy paste ideas basically from one world to another and back. Uh, so every time you create something, you have certain ideas, you have to be very much aware of the context in which you work. Um, so um, when I was invited to speak here, I thought, okay, maybe I should somehow talk about leisure, free time, uh, the culture of resorts, since I know that this was the topic of the summer school. And at first I said, well, you know, this is not the themes that uh, are in the focus of um, our office attention. Uh, but then, uh, after a couple of days, I thought that basically the whole idea of specialization, of uh, thematic focus, is very old-fashioned, because there is not such thing anymore. So basically, this is a beautiful place in, in the state of Michigan, um, a, a, a world wonder. The, you can see that different kind of minerals seep into the rock formation, forming some kind of natural barcode of different colors and different substances. I think it's a good metaphor of what we do uh, in architecture and urbanism. So a lot of topics mix in our projects. So I cannot say that I'm not interested in leisure or resorts. Of course, it's part of what we do. And I will try to show you how and why uh, it is important. Um, the first chapter of the three chapters that I have is called Leisure Seeping Into. And um, this will be about uh, a book. You're the very first outside of our team uh, which is working on, on this book to see uh, these ideas and concepts. This is the book which will be out uh, in October 2015. It is called Absolute Leisure. It is being edited by my partner Alexandra Sverdlov and Vini Maas. Um, I think that the, the idea of this book is very, very interesting and it, it is really instrumental for everyone who is looking today at leisure, at resort territories, at tourism, uh, for several reasons. Uh, this is the cover for you to see it better. So the idea of this book uh, went far beyond the usual understanding of what kind of vulgar leisure is. Um, they studied and met and interviewed uh, a lot of materials, for instance, photographed by uh, British photographer Martin Parr. Uh, you probably are familiar with his uh, work. Uh, this is, for instance, an artificial resort in the southern Korea. Um, so uh, he became sort of a homer of this vulgar leisure, of this uh, tourist destination. And uh, whenever we think today about uh, resource and tourism, we most likely imagine something like this. Um, there is quite a lot uh, done around this discourse. A lot of publications, a lot of books, a lot of uh, articles. Uh, in the Netherlands, in Spain, for instance, there are, there are regularly conferences around uh, leisure architecture, tourism. There is the whole research around elderly people living uh, along the coast of Spain. Um, so there is quite a lot done around it. Usually this kind of research is very critical. Uh, it's, it is focusing on negative things. It is really talking a lot about 
downshifting of, uh, of the natural uh, landscapes of the context. Um, it is very critical of the economic forces that are behind uh, this kind of developments. Um, but the Absolute Leisure book was not about that. So I'm showing you to tell you that this was not in the focus of attention. So they proposed uh, something completely different, very subtle look at the, the very subtle point of view at the uh, problematic of leisure. So what they try to do, they look at the very mundane things, at everyday life, at very simple objects, for instance, a bed, um, a grilling machine, uh, your car, your garage, trying to identify how leisure seeped in to our everyday life, identifying those small elements that usually slip the attention of architects who work with bigger scales, with space, but not actually noticing on the smaller scale very important new patterns emerging. So each uh, spread of this book uh, has different components describing a certain element of the new leisure. Um, so they have chosen this um, technique of a um, black and white drawing, axonometry, uh, actually quoting uh, Chinese painters of the 14th century who used a lot of axonometry to show the scenarios of how people live. The most uh, famous one you probably know is the city along the river. It's like a longer scroll existing in history where you can observe not only the space, and I would say not primarily the space, but life, how it is unfolding along the stream. Um, and in each case, they describe the context in, from the point of view of leisure. They describe the particular elements explaining how leisure became part of, of a certain activity. But what they also did, and I think this is an interesting part, they also did a calculation. Uh, there is a whole story around how they did it. It's an introduction that makes you aware of all the difficulties that the researchers encounter while calculating, because it's very hard. How do you calculate leisure? It depends very much on the context. It depends very much on the country. It depends on the GDP. It depends on the what middle class earns, right? However, they found certain techniques, and they did it together with the economists, with the team of economists, how to calculate what does it cost to have more leisure in our life. Um, I think one of the very first spreads, I like it very much, they studied also the AutoCAD libraries. Maybe you're familiar with these uh, little icons. Um, on the left, you see what was there in 2000 about leisure. And on the right, you can see what is there in 2011. So you can see how the library uh, has expanded, not only because the software became more advanced, but also because there is a demand for more detailed description of the landscape of free time, of leisure, of life after work. Good illustration. So by the way, this is why factory. Uh, you saw it from the other side. This is the view from the Tribune towards the screen. And they actually included this because uh, this was done as a new design by Ember DB uh, after the architectural department of Philadelph burned down six years ago. So this is a new uh, design. And what was important that became part of the book, uh, this is actually a school of architecture. You see that at the center of the school is a tribune. So the usual tables that you imagine when you think about the university are sort of removed to the margins. And what is most important is, of course, this um, part that you see on in the right top corner is a huge couch that was introduced not only for the students to rest after their hard work, but actually to work on that. So this became uh, a fundamental element. And uh, actually, last time uh, I was uh, speaking in Ljubljana, uh, there was this Greek architect um, who was talking about the battle between the table and the bed, which is going on, because we work less and less and less uh, at the table, and we work more and more and more in the bed. It's easier to check emails, to quickly talk on Skype while, while lying down, or at least reclining, as you do now. So in the center of Teodel, suddenly we found a couch. Imagine that 20 years ago, that was absolutely unthinkable. So this is one of the examples. And uh, they have done a whole research, I'm just showing you the tip of an iceberg, 
of what happened during the transition from um, the front quarter kitchen, you know what it is, right? It's a new standard that was introduced in 1926. It was a perfect machine for cooking. It really re liberated a woman. A household became very, very different after introduction of this very effective space. But what happened next in 1980s that uh, basically the perfection of the extractor hood that you can see in the center, it was not attached to the wall anymore. It became like a chandelier in the center of the space. It also liberated very much uh, the, the, the host, whoever it is, not necessarily a woman, it could be also a man who is cooking. So it became a stage. It repositioned entirely uh, the whole choreography of the kitchen, uh, making it also absolutely possible, of course, to unite the living room and the kitchen together. So now it's one space, and nobody smells the meat while watching the TV. So the whole, we call it the Jamie effect, and there is a whole story uh, around what Jamie Oliver brought into the story of cooking, which became sort of a leisurely activity, but it's an activity of a very particular kind with tools and gadgets which are amazing and very expensive. So it became sort of an absolutely new performance of a type that never existed before. Um, I could have quoted Bourdieu here, but I'm not going to do this. Um, so they, uh, they made a catalog. So for now, there are 50 types of leisures that are described. And among them, my favorite stories are about the shower. So the shower, again, like a kitchen, it was a very straightforward activity. You're dirty, you go, you wash yourself, uh, you have a towel or not, but this is what you do. Uh, in fact, it became a sort of a machine for pleasure with all kinds of relays and buttons and mod modus modi operandi. So this is a, a, a good example of, first of all, they also calculated, and it's based on some research done by some um, uh, companies that are producing this kind of appliances, that people are spending more and more time in the shower, which is, in our crazy world, it's a pretty interesting observation. So um, they also looked at the bed, how it is produced, what kind of layers are added uh, to our mattresses. It's becoming more and more a piece of art, rather than just a place where you're, where, where you're asleep. Um, they looked at the living room, the whole chapter is dedicated to this space, because now this space is becoming more and more soaked in all kinds of leisure activities. Um, th this, this is just a focus on a console with all the potential additions that you can purchase, and people do do that. Uh, so just if you look at the economy of the living room alone, that's, that adds up to a lot of money. Um, we looked at different things. This is a, uh, an example that I like, and please remember this example because I will talk about the library a little bit later. Um, this is our study of the library dock. You know, probably the Netherlands is at the forefront of library designs. And the best library in Delft, uh, which is a lab for library experiences, is introducing more and more leisure into the library space. So suddenly, uh, what was has been a cathedral of knowledge, of silence, of uh, respect for the books, is becoming, in, in front of our eyes, a place when you can see a lot of feet, because people are just sitting with their legs up, and, or they're lying down, they're reclining, they're sitting on the, on the floor, what's going on? Leisure seeps into this space, diluting the previous climate, the previous regime, in a very interesting and particular way. Enough with uh, the Y Factory research. You will get the book. I really recommend all students to buy it because there is a lot of very useful information, but also a lot of good drawings that you can just copy paste if you need. Um, so the next chapter is about Strelka. This is about uh, research that has been done uh, this year at the Strelka Institute under my supervision. The chapter is called Leisure, Quality, and Inequality. And uh, this was part of the project which was called Big, Big Future. Um, and what we asked students to do, uh, we gave them a list of trends that we have collected, our faculty have collected about 30 trends that various experts think 
in 20, 30, 40 years from now will shape our environment. Um, the list was quite long. Uh, we had certain criteria for this list. First of all, we wanted the, those trends to be globally significant, so it's universally important. Then Russia relevant, so then on, in our huge country there will be some kind of rep point of reference to this trend. It should be uh, really recognizable on a human scale, and it should allow for a project with a strong spatial dimension. These were the four criteria of the trends. There are very many things that we ask them to do, and one uh, um, um, team chose the growth of leisure economy as the trend. Uh, I just wanted to show you the final exhibition. Um, this is Strelka in Moscow. You see that in summer it becomes very leisurely, almost like water, um, but in winter it looks very, very different. Um, but uh, it's indeed a lounge, so this is a huge 27 meters mural uh, that was created by the students on top of the research, because what we do at Strelka and in our office is research-based design. So whatever they propose should be very much grounded into the understanding of the current momentum and preferably of the past as well. Uh, so this is, uh, this is the, the vision of Moscow, which is based on, on their research. Um, so this is the, the parts of the things that uh, the Growth of Leisure Economy Studio looked at. And you can see here yourself that in developed countries there are certain aspects that are very, very important. For instance, the number of singletons in the last uh, basically 40 years grew 80%. So many people are living alone in Europe and the US. Um, it brings in a lot of new things. First of all, new standards. We all know, Neufert, we all know different kinds of standards for collective living. But for living alone, this is something yet to be devised. Um, fertility rates in developed countries are going down. So you see that it's uh, minus 45%. It's pretty dramatic in the 50 years. So what's going to happen next? Basically, it is predicted that it will go, keep going down. Um, at the same time, the work week is being reduced by 10%, seemingly not so much. But for instance, in the Netherlands, where I live, people don't work more than four days a week. Um, you come on Friday to an office, which is supposed to be full of people, and you see it's almost like everybody's on vacation. So it's becoming like an absolutely new paradigm of living for yourself, maybe earning less money, but just spending more time on what? That's a very good question. What are you going to do in your spare time? They are trying to answer this question. They looked at what is called workforce polarization. Um, if you extrapolate the trend, uh, or all the trends that you have seen on the previous slides, you will see a very interesting thing. And maybe you cannot see because there are very small numbers. I'm sorry for the scale there. So what is going on uh, uh, in colors, color codes show us uh, the decade um, of 2000 to 2011 is in red. The previous decade of the 90s is black, and the previous decade of the 80s is gray. So what it shows different types of workforce. In the first column is non-routine cognitive. Basically, these are architects. Architects and designers is people who work with their minds, with their imagination, with their brain, but this is not a routine work, preferably. Of course, as sometimes there are certain routines involved. So there are also, you can see that from the 80s to the 90s, the demand for this workforce is growing, surprisingly. Maybe not so much in the last decade, but definitely the trend is upwards. However, there are two types of workforce groups uh, with a dynamic <coughs> completely the opposite. These are the routine cognitive, basically these are the accountants, the, uh, the bank tellers, the people who work in accountancy of all kinds, the managers of, of a lower variety, so nobody needs them anymore. You see how dramatically it falls in the last decade. The same thing goes for routine um, manual work. Routine manual work, these are the people who work at factories, so it's the residue 
of the previous industrial era where people were assisting machines. This is not needed anymore. And then the last the very interesting trend, you see this, is dramatically going up. It's a non-routine manual. These are people who work with their hands, but work creatively. These are, for instance, gardeners. These are, for instance, people who work with agriculture, but in a very new, inventive way. There is a demand for that. Um, this growing demand for high and low skilled workers is very much explained by the new automation. So, for instance, they quote the statistics of uh, automation of labor. In the left, uh, on the left page, you see that the shipment of robots all over the world in the last basically 10 years grew up 150%. So as we speak, you can imagine that robots are being shipped all over the world in different destinations and then they're being used. So there is a strange situation that, for instance, already in the US, on the other page you can see, uh, the middle class is shrinking. So what, was it, what used to be the red now is becoming black, and the trend is continuing. So on the one hand, of course, it depends very much on the country. Situation with middle class is very different from country to country. But there is a certain new tendency that we observe, and uh, there is a lot of inequality between people who are in demand. I showed you what types of workforce will be in demand, and there are people who are not. So it seems they, they put a classical picture uh, from, the, from the American bathroom, when one was indicated for the sink is indicated for white people and another for color people. So they predict that basically in 20 years from now there will be the same situation with inequality, but on a different basis. Interesting, yes. Dangerous, probably. Uh, this is another graph that I really would like you to look at. Um, I know it's difficult to look at the graphs one after another, but this is really interesting. This is a link between uh, habitual leisure, so how do you want to spend your free time, and income level. So the uh, red are rich, oh sorry, the red are poor, of course, and the black, the black is wealthy. So for instance, watching TV, you see that poor people, 62%, are watching while only 25 of wealthy are doing the same. Um, for instance, volunteering. I think this is a very interesting illustration of what's going on. Wealthy people, and uh, the researchers Thomas Corley, who was researching the different uh, implications of workforce, he was looking at rich people and poor people. For him, poor people it are those who uh, get annually less than $300 and have less than $5,000 in assets. So, well, for Russians, basically it means that almost all the country is really, really poor. Um, and um, by the way, it is supported by this data. So this is the very recent research that was done by Levada Center in Russia. So what Russian people are doing? Volunteering, only 2%. Watching TV, 79%. What does it tell us? Most of them are really poor. The only thing that I would like you to look at is reading. 36%. It's quite high. Please keep it in mind for, for the, late, the latest project that I will show you. Um, so where does it bring us? So the wild guess about what is going to happen with leisure is there will be leisure inequality. There will be different types of leisure that people will uh, adhere to. So um, here they are trying to compare the industrial and post-industrial modes, like for instance, key means of production in industrial mode, that would be manufacturing machines, of course. In post-industrial, that would be a focus on human capital. And what it means for, for leisure. Uh, in industrial, that was mostly relaxation and entertainment. You come after the factory at home, you relax. Um, if you have TV, you watch TV or you listen to, to, to the radio, you do nothing, basically. This is the best way to relax. In a new economy, post-industrial, you are still busy. You structure your leisure time. You do it differently. Self-presentation and self-improvement becomes like a next big thing. And of course, economy follows. There is a whole new economy servicing the people from the red society. 
So basically, the bipolar leisure industry of the future will have investment leisure and compensation leisure. So people who don't have a job, uh, who don't have a future, who cannot really find money to re-educate and actually join the elite, uh, are bound to a very compromised, very um, simple type of leisure. However, the elite, those who become trendsetters, who are wealthy and who have jobs, they are become increasingly complicated in their experiences of after work. It, at some point, this is what is predicted uh, by one of the most interesting leisure researchers, John Roger, um, at some point, you will never tell the difference between work and after work. So it will become two very structures, structured type of living, just with different purposes. Um, what also affects, of course, uh, the way we uh, spend our free time is the falling quality of the free time because uh, the research has found that we're more and more disrupted. And uh, for instance, in 1990s, the quality of leisure is really, really lower than at the beginning of the century. So they again uh, agree that uh, the investment leisure will focus very much on detachment from technology, however paradoxical it may sound, or maybe focus more on advanced technologies that will help to improve your health, your intellect, your body, and so on. Um, so these are, the, again, the examples of investment leisure, how people would like to spend their time, what exactly they want to do. For, for, for instance, volunteering becomes more and more popular in the Netherlands. It's already a, a, a current situation that the majority of my friends do something after work. They help elderly people, they, have, they help animals, they do something for sick children. Um, however, on the right side, uh, they, they predict TV to go, so even more TV watching, but now maybe uh, within the lenses that are in your eyes. So technology will help, of course, but you get the idea. There are two types of leisure that will prevail. And now to my last chapter. This will be about the project that my office has done that in some way summarizes these two big tendencies. First of all, the leisure that seeps in all activities, and another is polarization of your free time. The project is called 448 Urban Voids. This is a project for rethinking Moscow library system. There are 448 libraries, public libraries in Moscow. They are all over the city. They situate in very many different districts. They are of very different architectural typologies, and they are absolutely not popular today. Since our office is very strange in the approach, we would never actually wait for a client to approach us, because we know that nobody is interested in the work we do. So we actually formulate the brief ourselves, and then we go to a client and try to convince to do what we want to do. So this is exactly what happened with this, because together with our friend and colleague, who is a owner of a very famous bookshop in Moscow, we decided to do something about this. Because, you know, this is, if, if there are architects in this, in this room, you will see that this is a treasure of space, underused and waiting to be rethought. This is the history of public libraries in Moscow. You, you see that it started in the late uh, 19th century uh, by the special decree of, uh, of the Tsar and then gradually it has been growing and especially it started growing after the revolution um, and it reached its nadir under Brezhnev so you see in 1972 a lot of libraries had been added uh, to the previous collection and then there was a steady decline and the last two uh, faces on top uh, are the mayors of Moscow because previously mayors were not important after Perestroika, they became really important, so they started um, deciding the fate of public institutions in the city. And um, you see that uh, under Lushkov, some of them were added. But in 2013, the red dot is our suggestion to the current mayor to do something about it. Uh, so in Soviet times, libraries really became a system on an immense scale. Uh, they were um, conceived by Lenin's wife. 
She was very interested in pedagogy, uh, but also in reading. The primarily goal of this system was ideology. There was no other goal. So there were some Russian writers, some Russian classic in the library, in the collection, but usually whenever you enter, I still remember it from my childhood, there was always a big uh, shelf with all the classics of Marxism-Leninism on it. So basically from the very beginning, it was the anti-religious machine. So there were uh, always organized some meetings and conferences about how to combat the religion. Uh, but there was also the, for the children, the young pioneers, so a lot of really strongly ideological activities were taking place there. Uh, this is how it looks now. Most of the post-Soviet libraries look like that. You can see that at the back, the, the window is new, so the ceiling is new. There was some renovation, but essentially, it's a time machine. People who work there, the, the books that they offer, the whole system, you still recognize those beautiful um, drawers where there are cards and you can search for the book you don't need. Um, but basically it's like this. And it follows the fate of many other Soviet welfare systems. It's an incredibly interesting material of several Soviet welfare systems. These are just the examples, the Houses of Young Pioneers, for instance, uh, District Polyclinics, Museum of Local History, and Houses of Culture. All of them are equally in decay right now because there was never a proposition of what to do with the system as a whole. From the very beginning, we declared that the system is a monument in itself. It has an immense value, and it has to be rethought as a system. We started, as always, with the students. There was a studio in the University of Venice, together with the great urbanist Paolo Vigano. Um, we started and created this atlas of all Moscow libraries that listed all different typologies, all the buildings, uh, you can see that they're pretty diverse. There were no special buildings built for the libraries. The existing buildings were used. Um, every library was described very accurately uh, with plans and sections, but also with history, uh, or sometimes with propositions of what to do with this particular context or this particular space. Um, it was actually uh, um, very much connected to different transportation systems. This is a map of uh, Moscow subway system, and you can see that a lot of libraries are along the line. All the while, <laughs> while they were built, there was no metro there, so it appeared later. So a lot of thinking may come out of the fact that new transportation systems brought a lot of new life to the existing libraries. Um, this is how they look. Um, this is an in, in incredibly sad collection of uh, barred entrances, closed windows, unwelcoming, signs and uh, basically uh, they are indeed empty. This is how they look even after the renovation that some of them underwent. Um, so we thought that basically this is a huge loss, especially in Moscow. I don't know whether you have ever been there, but it's a huge city with an obvious lack of public space. And some of these libraries are in suburbs, in microions, where people have nowhere to go, especially in winter time when it's minus 20. Uh, so this would be a treasure box, hidden treasures. So this is what we produced. Um, it's a strategy for development of Moscow public libraries. It's a research, but also research-based guidelines that we uh, uh, proposed as uh, material for discussion uh, to the mayor. And I think particularly uh, one uh, graph made it all happen. On the right, you see the library expenditures per reader in Moscow and in Amsterdam. So you see that per reader in Moscow is 43 euros, and in Amsterdam it's 4.5 euros. And in Amsterdam, it's swarming with people, it's full of life, it's an incredible place, it's full of leisure and activities and entertainment. And in Moscow, I, I showed you, it looks like this. So what happens to this 43 per reader? Well, we have our ideas what happens, but uh, basically, first we wanted to show it to the municipality. They were pretty much impressed and say, okay, whatever, just, this is the mayor of Moscow in the, one of the renovated libraries. We just caught him somewhere in the corner and said, like, look, this is what we can do. And uh, the uh, suggestion was uh, to make a project that would, instead of working with collection services, staff and people and spaces separately, uh, to create some kind of program that will 
unite them. So it will become one project, and we as architects were very unlikely uh, candidates to conduct such a project, especially uh, in the eyes of Moscow municipality. Like, why architects? Why would you want to do this? You work with space. Go and do some kind of interior design if you want. But this was not the goal. The idea was to include everything because interior design will not help in this situation. You have to produce some kind of holistic design that will cover a lot of different things. First of all, my partner had classes with the librarians because education suddenly becomes really important. You change the interior design, you change the space, you change the purpose. But the librarians are the same, so they don't want to use uh, the space that you created. They ruin everything in the lottery very often just because they don't know how to use it. So you should have seen these classes with an architect jumping up and down in front of the librarians showing them how to greet people, how to lead them into the space, how to put books on shelves, as if we know, right? But we knew better because we created this new environment. And uh, we started with five pilot projects. We deliberately chose five different locations in the center, in the suburbs, uh, in the like richer neighborhood, in something where people usually don't go. And this five pilot projects, they actually show that the whole system can be renovated using these guidelines. Um, this was uh, the library that we have chosen. You can see a librarian in her holding her fort. So this is the reception. You cannot get anything without a passport. If you don't live in the neighborhood, you will not get anything. And generally, you should better get out because she's holding the fort, right? And she's a, actually a very nice woman, but this is, this is the whole culture. And this is, this is how, how the interior reading room looked like. So we proposed something completely different. So now, what was really important, it's not exactly how you design shelves or what kind of chairs uh, you propose. This is, of course, important as well, let's be honest. But what is important is that to introduce a totally new concept of uh, connection between the city and the library. So on the one hand, on the one hand, the people can look in, and many people were asking, what's going, what's going on here? Is it a boutique? Because usually with these huge windows and some kind of fashionable lit space, this is a boutique, but it's not. It's a library. Can I enter? Of course, it's public. Are you sure I can enter? Of course, you can go and take a book, you can work, you can sit, nobody will check on what you're doing. Um, we also started with some renderings, putting this in publication long before we started the actual renovation. Just also publishing them in youth magazines, in all kinds of hit publications, just to show that there is some kind of uh, stylistic energy in rethinking the libraries that it could be also hip in terms of presentation. And um, this is this library at night. So first of all, part of the project, the first thing we did as architects, we said it should be open until midnight. A lot of people tend to read in the evening. In the morning, many intellectuals are asleep, sorry. But also many people, like for instance, elderly people, they have problems with sleeping. Let them come there. Let them just be there. Because there is now there is coffee, there is tea, there is water. Just and this became sort of an advertisement of itself. There was no almost no branding for this. This became an advertisement of, of the best kind because many people also came to us saying, you know what? We didn't even know that there was a library in the neighborhood. We have been living here for ten years. And of course, this is, this is another point of view which is also very important. You sit at this table. We created like a long, long table that became a sort of recognizable element of all these renovated libraries. Why? Because if you sit at this table, you see what a person across you is reading. So it's much easier to start a conversation. It's such a simple thing. So, oh, you're also reading Dostoevsky. Cool. Let's have a coffee. Do you want to have sex with me? So there is, a, there is like a whole, like whole new platform for meeting people, making friends. I cannot really tell you how many new communities got started in this space. I really couldn't believe myself because this space offered one very simple thing. It offered peace and, and some kind of opportunity because 
apart from designing the, the reading salon, we also designed a room which was empty. We didn't know what, what they're going to do then. We said, like, this should be empty. And it started filling in with lectures and symposia, and suddenly there was a theater play written specifically for this library. So it became a, an, an incredible leisure center for people to spend, to pass their time. Um, this is uh, just an interview. This, this is our colleague, Boris, who is a, um, who's an owner of the bookshop, one of the most famous bookshops in Moscow. He consulted them on the collection as well, because of course it became also part of the architectural project. What kind of books are there? What, what do they offer to the people? So he dramatically increased the number of contemporary editions of publication, of recent publications, and that also brought a lot of energy. Um, you see how people sit on the windowsills. I really like this picture because it, it makes library a very open space. Um, we also took care of certain positions of the chairs, so the reader becomes really elevated. So you can see just, just a girl sitting in a chair becomes almost like a sculpture in itself. Um, and this is the result. In 2012, there were 300 visitors per month in this library. After renovations, 300 visitors per day. I think it's pretty impressive. Um, uh, a new type of, uh, of an Instagram photo was created, which is called Shelfie. Uh, so basically, uh, uh, if you look at this Instagram, there is now an Instagram of the CSD library. You can check it. So what people add, very rarely they photograph themselves working. They do a lot of other things. They, they do fashion shows, they do they just chat, they, they, you know, mail each other, they do nothing, they drink coffee. Again, exactly how I showed you before, leisure seeped in, we just gave it a chance. Um, and this is the exhibition that we have created right after, it's called The Fantastic Library. I think it sums up quite a lot this idea of a very hybrid space that allows for work. Um, and you see that the perimeter is basically an exhibition and the place where you can uh, do a lot of interactive activities, but you can also work and read. While uh, if you climb up this table, it becomes a stage, and in the center, uh, there is a meeting point where people talk and give lectures, and as such, it can be installed in any space. It can be also outside. It has been installed in one of the largest libraries in Russia, just in the lobby, and uh, people used it uh, very freely. We also created some uh, reading opportunities in the, during the summer festival. So uh, this is the summer reading salon. Uh, again, um, uh, in our case, we didn't do just um, some kind of objects or installations. We provide specific literature that you have read in this particular space, in this particular landscape. Um, and it, it became very popular. There was a queue, you can see there was a queue waiting for her to finish her Tolstoy part, her chapter from Tolstoy book and get out of here so the next could uh, really enjoy the book with the background of, of the landscape. Um, again, this is, this is one of the installations that you have through the telescope to read the very old manifesto from the 20s, um, a, a, a text which is very hard to understand right now, but it still has a vigor and some kind of energy. So when you see it through the telescope, you have to focus a little bit because we have troubles focusing. But with a, with a telescope, you have to focus, and then you suddenly start understanding the energy of the manifesto from 100 years ago. And uh, this is a lonely audio cone uh, in the birch wood that you can stick your head inside and listen to poetry. Um, so these are, of course, like a very casual summer uh, entertainment. But I think it was a good complementing the major problem of the reorganization. I think it says a lot about the way we think. Uh, so basically, uh, you remember this, uh, this graph I showed you before, the 36% reading. Um, people in Russia still have a lot of respect for books and for libraries, therefore. And we thought, okay, maybe we can use libraries for other things. So we proposed a crazy idea of a library hostel. Don't get scared, because all librarians got immediately completely scared, imagining like dirty backpackers <laughs> Uh, sleeping in between the shelves, but in fact what we propose is that there is a market space in Moscow, in many big cities actually, in Russia, of um, academic researchers coming to the city to work in libraries and institutions 
and there is no place for them for such an intermediate stay. It's not short, it's not long. They very often don't know the city very well, especially in Moscow. There are researchers from all over the world. Moscow is not very friendly, and very often it's scary. So you either have a very expensive hotel, and you have like a rat hole where you don't want to live. So we thought maybe we can create, uh, based on the system of an epitome, you know, like when two ecosystems come together and they overlap, a new quality appears in the center. So we suggested like a very new program of how library and academic hospital, hostel can sort of overlap, what kind of programs they can share, what they can do. And it seems like uh, we got um, pretty strong interest from, uh, from two businessmen in Russia who would like to invest in this because this potentially could become a chain. And I think this is a very interesting alternative to just closing down the libraries because now there is not so much money in the system and some of the libraries are going to be closed. So this could be like a next life of those libraries nobody wants. So basically, this is the result of this uh, quite modest project. These are five small libraries in, in, in Moscow. But um, we have registered 380,000 new library members in the city. And uh, basically, this is new tourists in the land of active leisure and pleasurable work. So this is what I wanted to report. <laughs> Thank you, Natalia, for a very, very inspiring lecture. So questions, comments, and so on. Okay. Thank you. Um, just a, a stupid question. What are people not allowed to do in the libraries? I mean, uh, is, are they talking a lot? And you talk um. about, um, or you say the inscribed members, if you maybe tell what do you need uh, to do before you can enter? And well, in, uh, in Soviet times and basically in, in the current system, um, you cannot borrow a book if you don't have a passport. Uh, you cannot borrow a book from a library which is not from your neighborhood. Um, you cannot choose a book yourself. So you have to ask a librarian, which means that you have to know what you need. So you cannot just wander leisurely along the shelves. That's forbidden. Um, <coughs> there are many other things that you cannot do. For instance, you cannot drink coffee while you're reading. Uh, you cannot use your phone, even if you are just SMSing. So there, there is a. If you want, there is a whole list of uh, restrictions that are that you will be just expelled from the library if you try to SMS someone. Um, or I know also examples when they were just confiscating the phones from the readers if they really needed to stay. So give me your phone. You can stay for another two hours. So, but libraries cannot be completely open. There is still a regime that has to be uh, imposed on, uh, on the space. And first of all, a certain uh, regime of silence. Uh, because uh, what we are trying to do, we're trying to zone it in a way that there are places where people can talk. For instance, uh, the, in the Dostoevsky Library, there is a place which is called um, Working Spot. We're not quite sure how people are going to use it, but we see that a lot of young people are working uh, there, just in the middle of the day. And sometimes people are having meetings there, but it's shielded very well with some kind of isolation material. So you can see them, but you cannot hear them. Uh, so they are like a fish in the fish tank. You can see them opening and closing their mouths. Very beautiful. Um, but in the, uh, in the library, in the reading salon, you have to keep uh, your voice down, you can talk, uh, but there will be someone looking after you, so you can just strike a conversation and, uh, but all other things are removed, basically. No passport, you, you can be from anywhere. Uh, now the, the books are coded, but actually, I think we wasted money on that. Nobody's one is going to steal anything, because these are old books, you know, that you have to be a very, you know, weird to, to steal this uh, editions from 1960s, but maybe, the, there are some examples, but we installed like this gate, so they make a sound, but, but in fact we don't need them. Um, but now you can drink coffee, and I don't remember a single instance of anyone spilling anything, because people are actually careful. You, you are with your coffee and with your book, you want to read it, of course you will be careful. Um, uh, you are not allowed to eat uh, in the, where you read, but there is a space, so it's basically very easy. 
Um, so there is a whole new, um, uh, yeah, it's a whole new regime, but silence remains in the center, of course. And then there is this uh, empty container that I mentioned, this space which can be filled in with whichever activity. And there you can do whatever you want. You can shout, you can dance, you can jump up and down if you need. So that is, yeah. Just a quick comment. I mean, the Soviet libraries are just like our old libraries. I mean, we all know this. You can never, ever choose the book yourself. You have to say what you want, and then they choose it for, your, for you and so on. My biggest impression when I enrolled to an American school was like, OK, I can walk through the library and choose my own books. And my kids go to this primary school, which is actually a very good school, but they still have the same library system. They have exactly the same cards, except that it doesn't say Soferaya, but it says Montenegro. And this is how they get the books. They have to know what they want. And it's usually just like uh, the reading, lectira or whatever. I'm just gonna give it a quick, a quick comment. I mean, I, I found, I found your project you presented really fascinating. I mean, it's you know because it's so. I'm like really uh, subjective now. It's actually it's like so close to what I think that the future of the library as a typology is. Yeah. <laughs> and you know, it's even if I sort of like allow myself to to sort of. Preview, you know, I can even imagine that space without books, you know. So the, 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 the library itself becomes kind of like a marketplace of knowledge, you know. You go there and you exchange knowledge. And then the knowledge exchange becomes part of the leisure activity. You know? So, and at the same time, I mean, this I'm referring to what Sima said, you asked before about this kind of what you can do, you can't do, you know. It's the library is a space, it's uh, and the rules which are actually imposed to that space are in a, are kind of like um, sort of increase uh, seductiveness of that space. It means you know that uh, you are there, you know you can actually sort of speak with low voice. You know you are in a s you become like a sort of in a you you allow yourself to to be in a sort of like a almost like an intimate relationship to the other you know. and I think that this is something which I found like really really sort of uh, um, contemporary or really new in a, in a sort of a digital aspect of the world of today so you go there you know kind of like physical presence with other persons there are certain rules which are sort of imposed or implemented in that space you are there to do I mean you go there you know to read which is actually very you know, today, from my perspective, very luxury activity, so that you find your own space, your own time to really read the book, not just to kind of flip through or, you know, scroll through. And I think this sort of like a physical presence, I mean, physical space, which allows you for that, I, I mean, I find it really, really new. You know. um, I think what is also very important, it's a very democratic space. Um, and I think that uh, part of this design and part of the whole thinking was also to offer some kind of neutrality, uh, if you want, not to make it overly um, festival or of overly stylish, of overly hipsterish, or this or that, just to provide a very neutral atmosphere that people can use for various purposes. And I think that it is a response of source to the statistics that I showed from the Srelka re um, research. Because I really don't like uh, what they show, this prospect of having inequality and leisure, that some people will actually opt for very vulgar ways of spending their free time, and there will be an elite doing some kind of uh, um, elitist, special, very structured type of, of, of uh, after-work activities. I think the library it basically solves this uh, um, opposition, because everybody can enter. If you if you want to read a stupid book or you're in the in the mood to read an old newspaper, you can do that, and the neutrality ensures that everybody will be equal. So in that sense, uh, for Moscow, especially in the current political climate, I think this is a very important project that can be stopped exactly for that reason. Yeah, I I, I just wanted to add that uh, I've been to the Doc Center. Uh, in Delft and uh, to the Bakema Library, which was like uh, redone in the recent years, 
And I can only say that everyone who's, who has problems with his own libraries, go there and visit them and talk to the people and also to the librarians. Because they say, like, in the doc center, they told me, I let even, uh, I, I, I prefer to a book that is stolen than picking someone out because of a false alert of a system. And they say, like, let the books be stolen. I, I don't care. And they, oh, they're not stolen in the end because the people take care of the books. Or you, can, you may eat there, you may drink wherever you want. You, you, you turn these libraries into cultural hubs and centers. And I think the books, in the end, they are important because, I mean, like, we, we are becoming more and more digital, but books, we are, like, more and more books are sold on every topic, especially architecture. And um, we love these books, and they are different from computers, but I can only engage your, you to ask your authorities to go to Delft and look at the libraries. I mean, like the, the Bakema library, the lobby was turned into an underground station kind of thing without a threshold. You, you enter it, and you feel like entering a, a, an underground station, which makes it easier for people with, I don't know, say like low education or whatever you want, or poor people to enter it because they don't have a strange feeling of entering something which is like not what they are used there. to. What, what is not theirs or might be not theirs. Because, but these spaces are theirs and they are often the only uh, space where they can do their uh, homeworks because they can do it at home because at home is too crowded or whatever, and they can... And yeah, families like, are too big, yeah. Hmm? Families are too big. So libraries are, there is a future for libraries, open Absolutely. libraries. Yeah. Okay, uh, I have information, and I want to, <laughs> to hear what are you thinking what about, about information? <laughs> okay, so a few days ago, I read that on, I think it's Shermietovo airport in Russia, they, they installed uh, barcodes, that were like you can download a uh, ebook and read it for free and they don't have only old like books but all the new ones and so on but the only trick is that it is on russian <laughs> well there is a huge flow of russian people going through australia Metal, so i think it's a good start i know this initiative i think it's a really really good thing to do because in Cherry Medica, there are not so many ways to kill your time while waiting. Unlike it's really scary. <laughs> it is. Unlike Skip Hole, for instance, in Amsterdam, where you can spend the whole day and uh, entertain yourself beyond belief. <laughs> 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 yes, but I think it's a, it's a very good uh, it's a very good beginning uh, of, of a new service in the airports. We are now talking about new services in uh, train stations. Uh, and connecting them actually to local libraries because a lot of people with children, they don't know what to do in, uh, on the station while waiting for another train to Siberia. So if you can just walk 50 meters and spend your time in a, in a, in a library and the librarians will not be scared of those who might steal a book and go to Siberia with it. <laughs> so then maybe uh, that would be a successful collaboration between different institutions. And did you think of making some this library and airports because that will be like amazing thing there. Uh, we we thought about that, but to be honest, we were more focused on public libraries in the city because I think for Moscow that was by far more urgent. Uh, uh, people who are in airports, they they are already you know good enough with their living. They are going somewhere. There are a lot of people who never go anywhere. You know, they are stuck in their uh, microion and you know they need a library. So for us, that was the first thing to do. But of course, there are many ideas where the library is a key, is an instrument to, to change a lot of different contexts. So this is it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, the, the libraries are open until midnight now. Are they less? Um, I mean, this is an increase of 50% of like labor or so. Or are they closed in the morning? Uh, we started opening them later, but it also depends very much on the neighborhood. We insisted also on uh, surveys in particular contexts, because in the city center there is no one there at 8 o'clock in the morning. People are asleep, it's like very casual neighborhoods, you know, people start having their coffee at around 11. So for them, working there till 12 is essential. But 
Um, if it's about, for instance, children's library, of course, some of the parents use it for their work after hours, but not up until 12. So it's, uh, it's also, there are certain guidelines for all of them, but there is also very context-related guidelines for each of them. So I think it's a system design. It's basically all as one, but at the same time, each is different. No, my, my question was rather, um, if the same, um, I mean, is it the same number of um, uh, staff per month, the percentage before and after just shifted, or is it also increased? You know what we did? Percent? We actually uh, split uh, one, uh, um, um, the place of a librarian, actually the salary is quite good. But the thing is that um, a lot of time was taken up by the defense. You know, if you're a librarian, you have to defend your collection. So you had to spend a lot of time and energy defending. But basically now, with this new regime, this is not necessary. So we split this place of a librarian, this position, in two. Having two people, younger people, for less money, uh, also doing quite a lot of their things uh, in this library. So, for instance, in Dostoevsky Library, we have only one chief librarian, and the rest are very young people who also work there part time. So, in if you look at abstract number, like at, at numbers and their books, there is no change in spend expenditure. Expenditure is the same, and but the amount of people is different, and also the way their work is structured is different. <laughs> <laughs> well, some of them actually uh, um, left because they couldn't work in these libraries and they went to the other ones because uh, they really couldn't accept this. And some of them, I, I'm sorry, I don't have the picture of before and after. This is almost amazing, you know, like a, a woman who I could never tell what was her age started wearing red pants and... and <laughs> and lipstick and, and becoming so, so much the soul of the place. Uh, but it, it, it cost us a lot, you know, like a lot of time, a lot of energy, many nervous cells died in the process. Uh, but I think uh, that was a, a pretty interesting personal story. There are good and bad stories, you know, it's not all happy, clappy. More questions? I think uh, we should move on. Thank you so much. Thank you, guys.